Our reading this morning is from Philippians 3, verses 1 to 14. No confidence in the flesh. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, and as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me now, I consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of, from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the word so far. Well, welcome from my side. Ooh bit loud this morning. Welcome from my side. Welcome especially to those who are here for the baptism or are just visiting. Uh, my name is Nelson. It is great to have you along this morning. I hope that you'll be encouraged and blessed, particularly now as we come to God's Word together. We've been working through the book of Philippians, and we're up to uh, the last little stretch, up to chapter 3. So if you have it in front of you, it'll be a help, um, but most of the text that I'll be referring to will be on the screen as well. Let's pray. Let's ask God to bless His Word. Lord, we, uh, we, we read in this passage Paul saying, I want to know Christ. And Lord, I pray that this morning we would come to know him. We would come to know him perhaps for the first time, or we would come to know him in a deeper and more meaningful way, that our lives might be changed as a result of what we hear. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a little boy had been going with his family to church for many years, and uh, the more he listened to sermons week in and week out as he sat there with his family, the more confused he got. And one day he asked his dad, he said to his dad, Dad, what does it mean when the preacher says in conclusion? To which his dad said, absolutely nothing. Well, the Apostle Paul is a great preacher, and so as you come to this passage where it looks like he's saying in conclusion in verse 1, uh, and then carries on for two more chapters, we shouldn't be too surprised. Uh, But to be fair to him, a better translation would be something like, now then, or right, so. And and in other words, what Paul is doing is not so much getting to the final end of his letter, but he is getting to the very important punchline of his letter. This section may be the most important section in the book, but you know, in it we see something at least of, of the heart of what Paul is wanting these Philippians to come away with. And so in verse 1 of chapter 3, Paul says this. He says, finally, or the new NIV uses the word further, finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. As Paul gets to the real heart of what he wants to leave these Philippians Christian, Philippian Christians with, what he wants to say to them, what he wants them to walk away with, ringing in their ears and in their hearts, it is this, this command, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Now, what's interesting about this command is that it is a command. He's not saying, it would be a great thing for you to rejoice in the Lord. He's not saying, let me make you a suggestion if you want to live well as a follower of Jesus. Why don't you rejoice in the Lord? It is a command. In fact, as he comes to the end of the passage, we're not going to get that far this morning, but in chapter 4, verse 4, we read the same thing. 
He says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Again, command. You know, joy is so important, Paul says, to the Christian life, to the follower of Jesus, that it must be commanded of us. And the reason is quite surprising. The reason joy is so essential to the Christian life is that it keeps us safe. Let me read again from verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out. Do you see the logic there? Our joy in the Lord, rejoicing in the Lord, is actually somehow a safeguard for us. And then it's again, similar thing at the end of the passage, chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord. Be safe in the Lord in this way. In other words, by rejoicing, dear friends. What Paul knows is this, that there are very real spiritual dangers all around us as we live the Christian life. As we seek to follow Jesus, there are pressures from all sides that will try and destroy our relationship with God. So the question then is, how do we keep safe as we live this life of following Jesus? And one of the key ways is joy. Joy. We learn to rejoice in the Lord. It's not as if joy itself keeps you safe, but what joy does is it's like a gauge. It's like a, a gauge on the dashboard, if you like. And as soon as that needle dips a little bit below where joy should be, that's a warning that we're not in the best of place, spiritually speaking. Uh, let me just illustrate it this way. In the, uh, in the early days of coal mining, apparently what coal miners used to do is they went into uh, this sort of high-risk setting. Coal mines were, were dangerous. You'd have all kinds of dangerous gases that could accumulate in the tunnels, methane, carbon monoxide. And, and the problem with these gases is not only will they kill you, but they're odorless, so you can't, you can't pick up the, the, the levels of the gases. And so what, um, what they did in the early days is they would bring a canary into the mine with them. And it uh, sounds a little bit cruel, but it was life-saving. And as long as the, what the, the thing about a canary is it's very sensitive to air quality. And so as long as the canary was singing and chirping and happy, they knew the air level and the air quality was fine. As soon as the canary stopped singing or keeled over, well, they knew they were in great danger and they had to get out of there. Well, that's kind of how joy works. When you lose your joy in Christ, you're in a very dangerous position. It's that gauge that tells you how you're doing spiritually speaking. Now, let's be clear. Joy isn't having positive feelings all the time. Biblical joy isn't feeling bubbly and optimistic or having a kind of just a, a general happy sense that life is going your way. No, joy is a resilient emotion that has a deep trust in God no matter what is happening to you. It's believing that you're safe in God's hands, that you are deeply loved, that your trust is in Jesus, and that you long to know Him deeper and to see Him one day face to face. That's what joy is. And it's something that only God can bring about in our lives. And that's why Paul will say in other places, joy is actually a fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, if all of this is true, and if it is something that only God can bring about, how can God command it of us? That doesn't seem possible, does it? What's for certain is that joy never came just through sheer willpower. Well, what I want to look at this morning is how Paul shows us there are things that we can do to make sure that our joy is found in the Lord. Three foundations, if you like, in order for our joy to flourish. They have to do with where our confidence is placed, they have to do with what we're living for, and they have to do with where our hope is found. Let's have a look at each of those in turn. Firstly, joy is rooted in where you place your confidence. Joy is rooted in in where you place your confidence. Now, as you read this passage, Paul's uh, tone changes quite dramatically from verse 1 to verse 2. Have a look again, verse 1 of chapter 3. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Then verse 2, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. I mean, how's that for a change of tone? I mean, up until now, this has been a very positive letter. There's hardly been any open uh, negative criticism of anyone. And even as he thinks back in chapter 1, if you remember that far back, to those who were preaching Christ and who were against Paul, even there, Paul's not that fussed. He says, it doesn't matter. They're preaching about Jesus. Let them do it. 
But now he talks about these other people who are opposing him as dogs, mutilators of the flesh. You know, it kind of sounds like he's talking about a serial killer or something. Actually, he's talking about a very specific Jewish group of leaders who were a problem wherever Paul went with the gospel about Jesus. These were guys who'd been following Paul around. And um, it's not that they were opposed to Christianity, but in fact, they were actually quite uh, keen to see Christians integrate into the people of God. But they insisted that if they do, Christians had to keep the Jewish practices, including Sabbath keeping, circumcision, and a bunch of other Jewish traditions. And if they didn't keep those things, they weren't acceptable to God. Now, we don't know if they've actually arrived in Philippi, as Paul writes to this church, but we do know that it's just a matter of time. And so Paul is, is warning these Christians. And the harshness of the language tells us that Paul thought these were, guys were a real danger to the Christian faith. He says, watch out, three times. Calls them dogs. And he's not talking about the little cute family pet, right? He's talking about you know, a, a mangy, kind of rabid pavement special that will take you out at the kneecaps if it could. And he also calls them evildoers. Now, this is, this is astonishing because if you think about it, if you had to meet one of these Jewish evangelists, we might call them, they would be the most law-abiding, God-fearing, uh, command-keeping Jews you would ever meet. And yet he calls them evildoers. He calls them mutilators of the flesh. And what he's picking up there is he used very graphic language is their insistence on circumcision. And now, Paul wasn't against circumcision. He was circumcised himself. Uh, he had Timothy circumcised as well. So why does he use such strong language to speak of these men? And the answer is it has to do with joy. Because he is absolutely persuaded that no human ritual, no ceremony can ever do anything to make you acceptable with God, ever. In fact, it does the exact opposite. It robs you of any chance of real joy. The moment you put your confidence in anything that you are doing for God is the moment that your joy will be taken away from you. And you will go down a path of insecurity and uncertainty and endless failure in your attempt to please God. And Paul says, I'm a living testimony. This is not me looking in from the outside. I was there. Have a look at verse 4. If anyone else thinks he has reasons for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. In other words, a thoroughbred. You know, not like me. I'm, I'm sort of part Swedish, part English, part South African. Uh, and now I'm now in Belleville as well. So, you know, I'm so mixed up. He is thoroughly Jewish through and through. The genuine article of the tribe of Benjamin. In other words, one of the only two tribes to have survived that Assyrian exile back in Israel's history. A Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee. Uh, you know, we have these negative, uh, if you know anything about uh, the, the story of Jesus, there are these Pharisees that appear on the scene. And we have in our mind this view of this sort of hunched over, mean old, grumpy man with a gray beard, very pedantic. But actually, the Pharisees were the religious leaders. They were the ones everybody looked up to, the most zealous for the faith. Verse 6, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. He says, I went to the, the nth degree to show that I was serious about my faith. I even persecuted the Christians. You couldn't find someone more zealous for God. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul says, if ever there was someone who had confidence in what they were doing for God, it was me. You think you've got something to brag about? Let's go head to head. I'll win hands down. He says, what did I discover about all of that? Verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. All those credentials, all those good works, all that passion for God, it's not just that it didn't contribute towards anything in, their, in Paul's relationship with God, it actually was loss. It tore away any chance he had of being right with God. He says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've lost all things and count them as rubbish. He actually uses a word there that's a bit impolite to translate, uh, literally the word excrement, uh, but even a, a kind of a more harsh version of that. He says, it's all rubbish. Uh, you know, one of the, I love the BBC docu nature documentaries. One of my favorites is Planet Earth. 
And one of my favorite episodes in that uh, box set is the one on caves. If you've seen it, it's phenomenal. And uh, they feature in this, this episode on caves, this huge cave in uh, Borneo. And what has, what's, what's uh, such a special, what's the feature of this cave is it has a hundred meter high pile of bat droppings inside the cave. A hundred meter high pile of bat droppings. And this, this pile of bat droppings supports an entire ecosystem, including the world's largest concentration of cockroaches on the world's largest pile of poop. <laughs> Is it impressive? It's incredibly impressive. It has to be seen to be believed. Are our good works and our religious credentials sometimes impressive? They can be incredibly impressive. But look a little closer, and they're all dung. When you root your confidence in those things that you do for God or those things that you've achieved for God or those things that can somehow make your character better before God, they are detestable and offensive to God. Because what they're saying to God is, I don't need you. I can do this myself. Verse 8, I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. The only solution in our relationship with God that has any value doesn't come from inside me, but from outside me. If I look inside, the only thing I see is sin. But Jesus offers me a righteousness, His righteousness, His perfect righteousness as a gift God will basically credit Jesus' perfect righteousness to my account and in exchange will take the guilt of my sin upon himself. And all I have to do to get that is what? All I have to do is nothing. Nothing. I simply have to believe that he did it all for me. I have to place my life in his hands and it is mine, is what the Bible says. What a relief this is. What a massive relief this is. Can you see how it might be the starting point to finding real joy? Because no matter how good we are, deep down, we know we don't measure up. None of us. I remember reading an interview with Madonna a while back, and uh, she says this. She says, this is Madonna, the, the famous actress who seems to have it all together. I, w I have an iron will, she says, and all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being, and then I get to another stage, and I think I'm mediocre and uninteresting. And again and again, my drive in life from, is from this horrible fear of being mediocre. I have to prove that I'm somebody. My struggle has never ended and probably never will. I mean, that's honesty, isn't it? See, the quickest way of destroying any chance of finding joy is to make your relationship with God performance-based. And Jesus says, that way of thinking, the only thing it's good for is being flushed down the toilet. But when, like Paul, you truly grasp that God has accepted you, not because of who you are, in spite of who you are, because of everything that Jesus has done for you, you can discover a joy that nothing can take away. And so he says in verse 1, rejoice in the Lord. Secondly, joy is shaped by the thing that you're living for. It's not just that Paul's values got turned upside down. His whole purpose for living was completely transformed. Let's read again from verse 8. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. In order that I may gain Christ. This is what he's living for now. When you discover that Jesus Christ has done everything for you and done it in spite of you, then he becomes everything to you. Remember back in chapter 1, verse 21, now you can understand why Paul would say something so crazy and radical like, to, for me to live is Christ. See, if he isn't, it's probably because we haven't really understood how much he's done for us. Becoming a Christian is not about what you do, it's about who you know. It's not a set of rules to be kept or rituals to be observed, it's about a person to love. And so in verse 10, Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know him more. I know him already, I want to know him more. It's about Jesus capturing your heart so that you want nothing more than to know him more and more. You know, when you stand before God one day, as we all will, 
God's not going to ask you and me to explain the doctrine of justification. He's not going to ask you to recite the message of the book of Romans or to unpack, you know, the, the, the way in which Ephesians is, is put together. He's going to ask you simply, did you love Jesus? Were you trusting in Jesus? Were you living for Jesus? You know, if your life came to an end today and you were met by the risen Lord, would it feel like you needed to introduce yourself to him? Would there be an awkwardness? Would you expect him to say, tell me about yourself? Or instead, will that day, whenever it comes, be a day of joyful reunion? When you expect him to run and embrace you and say, say something like, I've been longing to see you face to face. Here's the thing, when, when you're living for Jesus, you're doing the good works that the religious leaders are trying to do anyway, but you're doing it for a completely different reason. You're doing it now, not so that you'll be accepted by God, but as a response to all that God has done for you in Christ, because you love Jesus. See, it all flows out of a relationship, doesn't it? You know, my concern for many of us when we talk about our faith is we often talk about God's word, or we talk about the gospel, or we talk about faith in general, but we don't talk enough about Jesus and our love for him. Now, for example, if you go to work tomorrow and a colleague asks you, you know, why do you go to church? What would you say to him? Sometimes the language of our relationship with Jesus is missing, isn't it? Michael Rater, in his book, The Stirrings of the Soul, says it like this. He says, evangelical Christians talk about their faith as if it's essentially a creed that we subscribe to, rather than a person we belong to. Indeed, we could easily get the impression that the chief end of man is to read the Bible and study it forever. See, how do you know that you really love Jesus in this way? Well, you know that if you're living for Jesus, if you had to make a choice between what the world is offering you and what Christ offers you, you choose Jesus. You know that you love Jesus if at every opportunity to get to know him more, you'll take it. Whether that's coming to be with God's people and hearing more about him or gathering midweek with your small group. There's nothing that will kind of really push that out of the calendar unless it's really an emergency. These won't be chores or duties. These will be things that are fuel for your love for Jesus and help you to love him more. It means that you will try to live this world in a way that shows that Jesus is your treasure. You know, if people had to look at you and assess your life, would they say that you're living for Jesus or that you're living for something else? Living for Jesus means that if you lose everything else, you will still have your joy because you'll still have him. Thirdly, real joy is found when God changes not only where we place our confidence, what we're living for, but also, lastly, what we're hoping in, where our hope is found. We all pin our hopes on something as we live in this world, um, as much as the world tells us to live in the moment, and that seems to be the mantra, doesn't it? Live in the moment, seize the day, grab hold of each moment. Well, that's true, but everybody still has one eye on the future. It doesn't matter who you are. Some hope that we're holding out for, whether it's retirement or an empty home or the freedom to travel or financial security or a life free from worry or maybe even that hope of some kind of paradise after this life. I mean, doesn't everybody deserve that? Well, Paul discovered that all our hopes are empty if our hopes are not pinned in Jesus. And that's why so many people are living in a state of despair and, and hopelessness, because there are no other hopes out there, no other alternative hopes that ultimately satisfy our longings. You know, often the smarter you get, the more sad you are. Have you noticed that? The really clever people in the world are often the saddest people. And as they get older, they get sadder. And why is that? Because they realize that there's, there's nothing really that actually that you've pinned your hopes on that delivers. But knowing Jesus offers hope that is real, that does deliver. Hope that even overcomes our greatest enemy, which is death itself. Verse 10. It says, My hope is that I may know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. What Paul indicates here is that when you follow Jesus, your life takes on kind of a, a Jesus-like shape to it. There is suffering that comes. There is the, the cross before glory. But there is glory. 
And the hope that Jesus offers us is nothing less than the resurrected life, Paul says. The problem with this life, however good it is, is that it is, in the end, always swallowed up by death. Death is the ultimate joy killer. But what if death itself was defeated? What if our hope is not for some sort of disembodied existence in heaven somewhere, but actually a real existence in the new creation as Jesus raises us back to bodily life again? That's what the Bible's view of heaven is, ultimately. I'll tell you what, if you really believed that, there would be nothing that could destroy your joy ultimately in this world. Can you see how the hope that we have in the future impacts how we live in the present? We have, verse 10 tells us, Jesus with us, his resurrection power already at work in us. But as Paul says this, he's not naive. He knows that there will be suffering along the way. But it is different now. It is completely different now. Verse 12, he says, look, not that I've already obtained all this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenward call of God in Christ Jesus. He's saying to us, if you really want to find joy, make sure that you're looking forward. Don't look backwards unless it's to the cross and what Jesus has done for you. You know, one of the problems with looking backwards is that we're always holding on to something that's happened to us in the past. Or we're, we're counting on something we've done in the past. So we're either holding on to our past achievements or else we're looking back to our past failures. And both of those destroy us. Both of those destroy any chance we have of joy. And maybe the reason that you've got no joy is because you're still living in the past. Maybe people have hurt you or you've, you've hurt others. Things have been done to you or you've done things to others. But Jesus has come, you see, to wipe the slate clean, to give you a brand new fresh start where all of that is dealt with. He's making a brand new you without the flaws. Not, he says, I press on towards that. It's not that I'm perfect yet, but I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Isn't that great? We're all a work in progress. None of us are there yet, but he strains for it, he says. He presses on towards that goal. His present is not defined by his past. It is instead shaped by his future hope. So the command is simple this morning. Rejoice in the Lord. There it is, simple. You can take home that. You can write it on a piece of paper, stick it on your fridge. That's what God wants us to do. Rejoice in the Lord. But what he's saying is that The key thing about that is that it keeps us spiritually safe as we live in this dangerous spiritual world. It's why Nehemiah says in the Old Testament, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Strange thing to say, isn't it? The joy of the Lord is your strength. But the only way that ever happens is if Jesus is the one in whom we place our confidence. If he is the one that we're ultimately living for. And if he is the one we're ultimately hoping in. Let's pray together. I'll be quiet just for a few moments, and maybe you want to just quietly respond to God based on what you've heard this morning. Maybe for the first time you want to acknowledge that you need Jesus to be your Savior, your Lord. I'll simply speak to him this morning. Lord, we thank you that in Jesus we can find real joy as we live in this world. Not necessarily happy feelings all the time or being optimistic and bubbly and positive, but a joy that is settled and sure and unshakable. And thank you that it is rooted in our confidence that is not found in ourselves but in him. That it comes as we learn to live for him alone. And that it grows as we learn to find that future hope and believe in it and live towards it. So won't you help us to do this, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.